Behind me is a circle, and suppose that we pick three random points. So what is the probability that the triangle formed is obtuse? Firstly, this problem is actually quite interesting because it involves quite a bit of wishful thinking and some special placements of the three points. And while the goal of this problem or this video is to solve this particular problem, I also want you to learn a very special problem solving strategy whenever you're dealing with problems like this one. So let's get straight into it. Firstly, three random points, three random points that's not very pleasant to think about. It's not really easy to think about as they vary. So what if we only had one to worry about? Well, let's first think about fixing the first two points and just letting the third one vary. But where do we even fix the first two? Well, we're going to consider a very special placement of those two points. What if the first two points were fixed to be diametrically opposite, meaning that they form a diameter. Well, in this case, you will never get an obtuse triangle because if you just pick any random third point, such as this one, and if you were to draw the triangle, then because P1, P2 is a diameter, this is a right angle. So you're not going to get an obtuse triangle. So they should not be diametrically opposite. So now we know that the first two points have to be such that they form a major arc and a minor arc of the circle. And the names kind of speak for themselves. Major, you know, a longer one, and a minor, minor arc, shorter arc. So we are going to consider this configuration. Now, where can the third point be? Well, I think it's easiest to first consider maybe within the minor arc, right? That's a pretty special case. So let's draw the third point somewhere arbitrarily in the minor arc formed by P1 and P2. Well, will this form an obtuse triangle? Well, we can draw it and see what happens. Maybe just quickly get some observation before rigorously proving it. It looks like it. Definitely, it's possible. It looks like it. So let's get into proving it. Let's first consider the center of the circle, okay? Now, we're going to, from P1 and P2, draw lines to the center, basically forming two radii. Now, because this arc over here is a major arc, we know that this angle over here is clearly going to be greater than 180 degrees. Now, notice that this angle over here is actually subtended by this major arc P1, P2. Now we know that by the inscribed angle, central angle theorem, the inscribed angle is half the central angle, right? So this central angle corresponds to this inscribed angle, so this angle over here is half of this, meaning it is greater than 90 degrees. So yes, it will form a, an obtuse triangle. So therefore we know that, we know that the minor arc formed by P1 and P2, this entire region is valid. So I'll draw a check mark indicating that. Okay, well, what if the third point was not in this minor arc? Well, if it was in this major arc, then right now we have no borders we know of which can mark where we can place the third point in this major arc. So, we kind of have to rely on some wishful thinking. We have to maybe create some borders that we think might be helpful. So what do you think is a special case? Well, what if we consider the diametrically opposite points from P1 and P2? Well, that's a special case, so maybe that might help. And of course, when you're problem solving, you are not going to be sure, but it's always better to give it a try than not. So let's first connect through the diameter so that we can get diametrically opposite points for P1 and P2. And I'll name this point P4 and this point over here P5. Now, notice that we've drawn the diameters and this splits the major arc of P1 and P2 into three separate regions. 
So now we have a bit more of a foothold. We don't just have the entire arc to consider. We have separate regions. So what if we place the third point within the arc P1, P5? Let's just place the third point over here. Kind of small, but you know, P3 is over here. So over here. Now this is P3. Will this form an obtuse triangle? Well, consider this. P2 to P3 by the direction I'm drawing or by the direction I'm tracing, this over here is actually a minor arc because P2 would have to go all the way to P5 to form the half circle. So all the way to P3 would be a minor arc, obviously. Now notice that earlier we showed that if a point was placed in between the minor arc formed between two points, then it will be an obtuse triangle. Notice that P2, sorry, not P2, P1 over here, P2 is P1, <laughs> P1 is actually placed in between the minor arc formed by P2 and P3. And as we just proved, that forms, a, that forms an obtuse triangle. Specifically, you'll actually form an obtuse angle at P1. So yes, if we place P3 within the arc P1, P5, it will work. So I'm going to use green once again to indicate that it does work with a check mark. So similar details also form uh, an obtuse triangle in P2, P4. In fact, it's symmetric. It's the exact same case. So this obviously also works. We just have one more case remaining. What about the arc from P5 to P4? Specifically, we're looking at the minor arc formed between P4 and P5. So let's just draw an arbitrary point over here. This is where our P3 is going to be. Well, let's connect the P1, P2, P3 triangle because that's the one that we're looking at. That's the polygon that we're looking at. So let me just do a good connection of these three points. There we go. That looks very good. So now, does this have an obtuse angle? Well, let's first consider this angle over here. Notice that this angle is actually inscribed within the minor arc of P1 and P2. And we see that the central angle of the minor arc of P1 and P2, it, it actually is this angle over here. However, this angle is actually less than 180 degrees because P1 and P2, the corresponding arc is a minor arc. So this is less than, this is less than 180 degrees. This is less than 90 degrees. No, no luck. So what about this angle over here? I'm actually going to circle it to indicate that this one did not work. So what about this angle over here? Well, consider this again. This, this angle over here is actually inscribed within the arc from P2 to P3. I should probably write P3 like this, right? So P3, P2, or P2, P3. This arc inscribes this angle. And we know it's a minor arc, right? Because once again, P2 would have to go all the way to P5 to form half the circle. So P2 to P3 is, well, in this direction at least, it's a minor arc. So once again, similar details. This is not going to be any greater than a, than a 90 degree angle. So no, that will not work. And you probably have guessed by now that this angle over here, right? This angle at P2, because once again, P1 to P3 is a minor arc going in this direction. This is going to be less than 90 degrees. And actually conclude that this minor arc from P4 to P5 is not valid. So I put an X to indicate that. Now, because there's only one region that is not valid, I think it's easier to consider the probability that the third point lands in this region and then subtract that from one. <laughs> Don't do more work than you have to. So let's go ahead and consider the size of P4 to P5. There's one problem, of course, and <laughs> it's that this size is varying. It's not fixed. We only fixed P1 and P2 for the sake of getting some sort of foothold. So we need to think about what happens as this varies. Well, one key problem solving strategy to think about varying sizes is to maybe consider its minimum size and maximum size. So consider this. This diagram is not going to be as large, of course, but <laughs> it, it will do. Now consider this. 
if we had p1 and p2 very close to each other, of course, this isn't very close, but if I draw it too close, nobody will see. <laughs> so if they were very close to each other, then we see that if we were to, again, consider drawing diametrically opposite points, as p1 and p2 get closer and closer together, the not working arc, the minor arc of p4 and p5, that is, this becomes smaller and smaller. So it actually tends towards zero. Of course, it won't actually be zero because we need these two points to be distinct, but they can get as close as they want and it will approach a minimum, not minimum, but a lower bound of zero. Similarly, if we instead had P1 and P2, and now we're considering the maximum, if we had P1 and P2 very close to being diametrically opposite, of course, they cannot, be uh, they cannot be diametrically opposite. But if they were very close, P4 and P5, right, they are actually very close to being half of the circle. So this over here, this maximum would actually approach an upper bound of 50% of the circle. Now, why did I consider the minimum and the maximum? Well, it's because that, notice, Obviously, the three points were uniformly chosen. Everything from 0% to 50% were equally likely, right? Therefore, if everything is equally likely, then you actually need to compute the average probability. That is, you need to calculate the average length of this arc, or maybe the expected length of this arc. So the average proportion that this arc makes up is actually 0% plus 50% divided by 2. And this would obviously evaluate to 25%. So we see that this arc length actually makes up 25% on average of the entire circle. Therefore, the probability that we will not get, a, get an obtuse triangle is 25%. Therefore, the real probability that we are looking for is 1 minus 25%, or of course, 1 quarter. So that will be 3 over 4. And that is our answer. 3 over 4 is our answer. <laughs> and while this answer might be satisfying on its own, notice that throughout this entire problem, we had to consider very special placements of the points. Notice when we had to consider when P was in the major arc from P2 to P1, right? We didn't have any barriers. We didn't have P4 and P5. We had to generate them based off of wishful thinking. Anyway, thank you very much for watching this video. I hope you found this video interesting. If you did, please do consider dropping a like and subscribing. Thank you very much. Bye.